The Betrayal of the Conspiracy At Rome, meanwhile, Lentulus was carrying out Catiline's orders. He worked, personally or through agents, on all whose character or fortune seemed to mark them as fit instruments for revolution, not confining himself to citizens, but approaching all sorts and conditions of men, provided they could be of service in the rising. In pursuance of this policy, he directed one Publius Umbrenus to seek out the envoys of the Allobroges and induce them, if possible, to take part in the war as Catiline's allies. The fact that they were overburdened with public and private debts, as well as the naturally warlike temperament of the Gauls, would, he thought, make it easy to persuade them to such a course. Umbrenus, who had done business in Gaul, was known to many of the leading men in various Gallic communities and knew them personally. So without wasting any time, directly he saw the envoys in the forum, he asked them a few questions about the condition of their country, and then, pretending to be sorry for them, inquired how they hoped to extricate themselves from such serious difficulties. Complaining bitterly about the rapacity of the Roman officials and blaming the Senate for its failure to help them, they said that nothing but death could release them from their misery. Why, I myself, said Umbrenus, if only you will act like men, will show you a means of escaping from your misfortunes. Inspired with high hopes by his words, they implored him to take pity on them. No task, they declared, could be so formidable or difficult that they would not jump at it if it would but free their state from debt. He then took them to the house of Decimus Brutus, which was close to the Forum, and thanks to Sempronia, was no stranger to the conspiracy. Brutus was no hindrance, since at the moment he was away from Rome. Umbrenus also summoned Gabinius in order to give greater weight to the proposal he intended to make, and in his presence told them of Catiline's conspiracy, and named his principal accomplices, including among them a miscellaneous collection of entirely innocent persons, with the object of inspiring them with greater confidence. Eventually he received from them a promise of assistance, and sent them back to their lodging. The Allobroges could not for a long time make up their minds what to do. On one side of the scale were their debts, their love of fighting, and the prospect of enrichment if the war was successful. Against these must be set the greater resources of the Roman government, and the consideration that by playing for safety instead of gambling, they could make sure of a reward. In the end, the good fortune of the Republic prevailed, and they communicated all they had been told to Quintus Fabius Sanga, who regularly acted as their patron in Rome. When Cicero was informed by Sanga of Lentulus's plan, he instructed the envoys to feign great interest in Catiline's conspiracy, and by getting in touch with the rest of his accomplices and making them fair promises, to try to obtain the clearest possible evidence against them. At about this time, there were disturbances in northern Italy and in Provence, as well as in Picenum, Apulia, and the country of the Bruti. The agents whom Catiline had sent to these regions were trying to do everything at once, with a rashness that made it seem almost as though they had lost their reason. By their nocturnal meetings, transportation of arms and weapons, and general hurry and bustle, they had caused more alarm than real danger. A number of them had been tried and imprisoned by the praetor Quintus Metellus Sailor in accordance with the decree of the Senate, and similar action had been taken by Gaius Morena, the deputy governor of Transalpine Gaul. Lentulus and the other conspirators in Rome had now collected what seemed to them a large force, and had decided 
that as soon as Catiline's army had reached a certain point in its advance towards the city, the tribune, Lucius Bestia, should convene a public meeting and protest against the steps taken by Cicero, throwing upon that excellent consul the odium of having provoked a conflict which had assumed a very serious character. This was to be the signal for the rank and file of the conspirators to carry out their various tasks during the following night. These, according to report, were distributed as follows. Statilius and Gabinius were in charge of a large body of men who were to start fire simultaneously at twelve chosen spots in the city, in the hope that the ensuing confusion would enable them to obtain access more easily to the consul and the others whose lives they were plotting against. Sethagus was to wait at Cicero's door and make an armed attack upon him, while others did the same to the victims allotted to them. The youth still under age, mostly sons of noble families, were told off to murder their fathers. When the fire and the bloodshed had produced a general panic, they would break out and go to join Catiline. While this was all being decided on and planned, Sethagus kept on complaining that the others lacked spirit, and by their hesitance and procrastination were wasting golden opportunities. Action, he said, not debate, was what such a crisis required. He himself was ready to storm the Senate House, if only a few would help him. The rest might stand idle if they pleased. Naturally impetuous and violent, he never hesitated to act and regarded speed as the first essential for success. The Allobroges, in accordance with Cicero's instructions, got Gabinius to introduce them to the other conspirators, and demanded from Lentulus, Sethagus, Statilius, and Cassius a written undertaking for them to carry under seal to their countrymen. Without this, they said it would be difficult to induce them to take such a serious step. All but Cassius unsuspectingly did as they were asked, but Cassius said that he would shortly be going to Gaul in person, and in fact he did start from Rome a short time before the envoys. A man named Titus Voltercius of Crotone was sent by Lentulus with the Allobroges, so that before proceeding to their own country, they might confirm their alliance with Catiline by exchanging solemn assurances. Lentulus personally entrusted to him a letter for Catiline, of which the following is a copy. Who I am you will learn from the bearer of this. Reflect what a serious situation you are in, and remember that you are a man. Consider what your interests require. Seek help from all, even from the humblest. He also sent a message by word of mouth. What he asked was Catiline's idea. Since he had been declared a public enemy by the Senate in refusing to enlist slaves, all was ready at Rome according to his orders, and there must be no delay on his part in advancing nearer. The next step was to fix a night for the departure of the envoys. Cicero, to whom they had communicated everything, ordered the praetors, Lucius Valerius Flaccus, and Gaius Pompinus to wait on the Mulvian Bridge for the Albrogi's party and to arrest them. He explained the general purpose of their mission, but gave them discretion to act as circumstances might require. The praetors, who were experienced soldiers, quietly occupied the bridge, according to their orders, by posting pickets in hiding. When the envoys and Voltercius reached the spot and heard shouting on both sides of them at once, the Gauls quickly realized what the plan was and promptly surrendered to the praetors. Voltercius at first called on the others to resist, and sword in hand defended himself against his numerous assailants. When he saw that the envoys had deserted him, he began by earnestly begging Pompinus, to whom he was known, to save him, 
but finally he lost his nerve and yielded to the Praetors in as abject fear for his life as if they had been foreign invaders. When it was all over, a full report was speedily sent to the consul, who delighted as he was at the news, was at the same time harassed with anxiety. For although he rejoiced in the knowledge that by the discovery of the plot his country was rescued from its peril, yet he had a difficult decision to take. An abominable crime had been brought home to citizens of the highest standing. What was his proper course? To punish them would lay a heavy responsibility on his own shoulders, but to let them go free might mean ruin to the state. So, summoning up his resolution, he sent for Lentulus, Cethegus, Statilius, Gabinius, and also for Caeparius and Terracina, who was about to set out for Apulia to stir up a revolt among the slaves. They all came without delay, except Caeparius, who having left his house shortly before, had heard of the betrayal of their plans and fled from the city. As Lentulus held the rank of Praetor, Cicero himself took him by the hand and conducted him to the Temple of Concord, to which he ordered the others to be brought under a guard. The Senate was summoned to meet there, and before a crowded house, Voltorcius was led in with the Gallic envoys. The Praetor Flaccus had been told to bring a dispatch box containing the letters which he had obtained from them. When Voltorcius was questioned, first about his journey and the letter he was carrying, and then about his purpose and motive, he began by inventing a story and pretending to know nothing of the conspiracy. Afterwards, on being promised a pardon if he would speak, he revealed all he could of the facts. But he declared that as it was only a few days since he had been called in to help by Gabinius and Caeparius, he knew no more than the envoys. All he could say was that he had often heard Gabinius mention Publius Autronius, Servius Sulla, Lucius, Vercantius, and many others as being in the plot. The Gauls gave evidence to the same effect, and when Lentulus pretended to know nothing about it, they proved his guilt by referring to his letter, and by repeating words which he had often used. The Sibylline books, he had said, prophesied that Rome would be ruled by three, Cornelii, Cinna and Sulla had been the first two, and he himself was the third, who was destined to be master of the city. Moreover, it was the twentieth year since the burning of the capital, a year which the soothsayers, when consulted about the meaning of various portents, had repeatedly declared would be marked by civil bloodshed. The letters were read after each of the accused had acknowledged his own seal, and the Senate then decreed that Lentulus should resign his office and that he and the others should be kept under open arrest. Lentulus therefore was delivered over to Publius Lentulus Spinther, who was then aedile, Cethegus to Quintus Cornificius, Statilius to Gaius Caesar, Gabinius to Marcus Crassus, Caeparius who had just been caught and brought back to a senator named Gnaeus Terentius. The disclosure of the plot produced a volte face in public opinion, the common people who at first in their desire for a new regime had been only too eager for war, now cursed Catiline's scheme and praised Cicero to the skies. If they had been rescued from slavery, they could not have rejoiced more. The other acts of violence that a war would have entailed, far from causing them any loss, would have provided them with plunder. But when it came to incendiarism, this they looked on as something monstrous and inhuman, and particularly disastrous for them, since their sole possessions were their clothes and other articles of everyday use. On the next day, a certain Lucius Tarquinus was brought before the Senate. He was said to have been on his way to join Catiline when he was arrested and brought back. 
He offered to give information about the conspiracy if he received a promise of pardon, and on being told by the consul to speak out, he made a statement very similar to that of Voltercius about the preparations for fire raising and the massacre of loyal citizens, and about the rebels' intended advance on Rome. He went on to say that he had been sent by Marcus Crassus to tell Catiline not to be dismayed by the arrest of Lentulus, Sethagus, and the other conspirators, but to march all the more quickly on that account, with the object both of encouraging those of his partisans who were still at liberty and of facilitating the rescue of the prisoners. The mention of Crassus's name, a nobleman possessed of immense wealth and influence, gave the Senate pause. Some considered Tarquinus's allegation incredible. Others, though they believed it, thought that in such a crisis a powerful man like Crassus should be conciliated rather than provoked. Many too were indebted to him as the result of private business transactions. So they all began to shout, saying that the informer was a liar, and demanded a debate on the subject. It was accordingly brought up on the agenda by Cicero, and a full house registered its opinion that the information was false, and decreed that Tarquinus should be kept in custody and not permitted to make any further statement unless he revealed the name of the person who had suborned him to fabricate such a grave indictment. Some believed that this charge had been trumped up by Publius Autronius, with the object of shielding the other defendants, whose chances of acquittal would be improved if such an influential man as Crassus were incriminated together with them. Another view was that Tarquinus had been set on by Cicero, lest Crassus should make trouble for the government by following his usual practice of coming forward in defense of bad characters. At a later date, I actually heard Crassus declare with his own lips that this infamous accusation had been made against him by Cicero. About the same time, Quintus Catullus and Gaius Piso tried in vain by entreaties, cajolery, and bribes to persuade Cicero into putting up the Allobroges, or some other informer, to bear false witness against Caesar. Both these men were bitter enemies of Caesar. Piso, when on trial for extortion, had been denounced by him for unjustly executing a man in northern Italy. Catullus had hated him ever since they were rival candidates for the chief pontificate. For at the end of a long career, during which he had held the highest offices, he had been defeated by Caesar when the latter was still a comparatively young man. Moreover, it seemed an opportune moment to embarrass Caesar, who by his splendid generosity to his friends and by the lavish scale of his public entertainments when he was in office, had contracted very large debts. On finding that they could not prevail upon Cicero to commit this enormity, they took the matter into their own hands. By accosting individuals and circulating falsehoods which they pretended to have heard from Voltercius or the Allobroges, they provoked such intense feeling against Caesar that some Roman equites who were serving as an armed guard round the Temple of Concord, carried away by the gravity of the danger or by their own excitability, tried to show their patriotism by threatening him with their swords as he came out of the Senate. 